Welcome again, Awareness Explorers. It's good to have our tribe, our community with us to explore new topics, new discoveries, new planets, new inner realms. And we're excited today to have a guest explorer who Brian will introduce in a moment, but something I'm excited about because she's an expert in something called the voice dialogue method. And I am quite familiar with this uh, approach to both psychology and spirituality, and it's going to be very interesting. But first, let me say hi to Brian. How are you doing, Brian? Excellent, Jonathan. How are you doing? I feel really good. And um, I hate to use the word excited because I always use that. Thrilled. We'll, we'll have to get the source, but I'm very uh, curious to hear what Bridget has to say. But first, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about Bridget? Sure, we are very happy to have as our guest today, Bridget Dengel Gaspard, who is a master voice dialogue facilitator. A voice dialogue is, is a method that was created by Hal and Sidra Stone, and we'll talk a little bit more about them as we go. And uh, Bridget is also an author, and her new book is called The Final Eighth, Enlist Your Inner Cells to Accomplish Your Goals. So with that said, Bridget, welcome to Awareness Explorers. Thank you. It's great to be here. I actually, um, I don't always say this, but I actually read your book uh, <laughs> because I, I have a history. I lived with a guru for 20 years that focused on the idea that we're made up of a lot of different parts that all want different things. And so I was quite familiar uh, with that perspective. And I don't really know how people get along without it. You know, to think that you're one thing is now strikes me as like, you know, that's such an inaccurate map of what's going on. Um, but I'm wondering, in your therapy practice, do you use voice dialogue mostly in a what you'd call psychological capacity, or does it also have spiritual overtones? I use voice dialogue a lot of different ways. So some is people want to use it for psychological issues like depression. But like you said, it's true. Our terrain, our inner terrain is made of many selves. So if you're struggling with depression, you have depressed selves, but you also have maybe hidden optimistic selves, resilient selves. And so some people actually come to me because their guru or their teacher has told them they're doing a spiritual bypass and that they should come do voice dialogue to actually meet their smaller selves because they're important too. They're part of the history. And so I would say that it depends on the person because what I love about voice dialogue is it really meets the person wherever they is. They are. And I think there's a spiritual aspect to it because growing awareness to me, just naturally, it's a consequence is, is a, a type of spiritualism. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Go on, Brian. Yes, and one, yes, and, and one of the reasons that we ask you on to Awareness Explorers is because one of the key precepts in uh, Inner Voice Dialogue is the concept of the aware ego that we have all of these selves, some of them are selves that we know, some of them are disowned selves. And part of the process is looking at it from a larger perspective. Um, could you tell us a little bit about voice dialogue, how it works and, and the, aware, uh, the aware ego process? Absolutely, you, um, you really portrayed it very well. So the idea is we come in and we, are in an operating ego before we basically become aware. And so I agreed the operating ego, people often think, oh, that's me. But really what voice dialogue would say, that's a collection of primary selves, the responsible self, the doer, whatever it is we think of as me is a bunch of primary selves. And so in voice dialogue, you facilitate the selves. So you have a primary self and in the process, you go to another part of the room and you say, let's talk to your responsible one. And then when you talk as that responsible one, you're not asked at all to be irresponsible. You're to completely get curious about who you are. So tell me more about what you're responsible for, what you care about, where you live in the body. And then you come back to center and that gives you a more aware ego because now you have separated from that primary self. You realize both intellectually, but also physiologically, experientially, 
that, whoa, I'm so much more than that. And that we call that the aware ego process because the other thing is it's never a state to arrive at. Hal Stone, who is one of the co-creators with Sidra Stone, used to laugh like, well, that's it. I'm aware and now I'm done, which of course is ridiculous. He was joking. Mm -hmm. And then say that you would go to another self in a session, like an irresponsible self, or you might go to a, I don't care about anything. Like not necessarily irresponsible, but I could care less. And you're like, oh, okay, I could care less self. Tell me about you. And then also you notice them energetically. So the I could care less would be very different physically. Maybe barely speak, like I could care less about sharing about myself as well as anything else. <laughs> and then as the facilitator, you just go in, what else don't you care about? And what else is irrelevant? And you mean it, you're curious. And because every part of us has the noble purpose of protection of, of, of our vulnerability. And so we're taught things by our culture, like not caring is wrong or not caring makes you selfish or cold, you know, and all of these selves often believe their own bad press. So that's another thing. When you say, talk to the, I don't care self, um, you don't, you, that self often goes, you know, I've been accused of, um, being snobby and that's painful to me when really I don't care and so mm -hmm. often doing voice dialogue is often a type of detox you realize that the negative labels you hold about this part of yourself were given to you and they're not even what the self is about mm -hmm. then again you come back to center and in that process you have an even more aware ego because you've separated from that self so, so would you yeah. say that what you're trying to achieve is to uh build up or increase this aware ego and if so what is the advantage of that exactly that really is the whole goal and i always like to say the goal is kind of boring get more conscious no matter what and so the so but the idea is then with your aware ego process you're not uh limited to your automatic responses to your um biology and your conditioning you have this sense like wow I have more. So even when you're new to it and you find yourself doing the same old things and you're like, oh, I did it again. I said yes when I meant no. You have that awareness and you're like, I see I'm doing it. Now I get it. Next time I can do even better and say yes when I only mean yes. And so that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. And there is one more part to the voice dialogue model that includes awareness, which is a whole separate thing. And it's called the awareness level. And that's much more like the witness state that people might talk about in meditation. So after you do a session where you go to a self and then a different self, and in the process, you grow your aware ego. There's one last section, which is you, you separate and you go as the, as the client, you would go to a different part of the room and you would literally witness no words you, the terrain that you've just facilitated. So like you get to watch like the mountain that gets to just be in the atmosphere. And so you get the whole benefit of the session, not just from an intellectual or even emotional point of view, you process it from this wordless state. You take as much time as you need and you just get to be with it. Kind of like stepping back, not kind of, it's you're completely stepping back. Then mm -hmm. at the end of a session, you get to process all of this. And it's just, it's like you get to go further and further away from that original self system you thought you were. So the witnessing the terrain, after you've maybe explored or let a couple of these parts of you talk, um, you said it's wordless. So am I just kind of like thinking about what just happened or what might that look like? It, what it literally looks like is you're either standing or sitting and silently observing. We would encourage it if not to be too intellectual, but if thoughts come through, you, you let them. But mm -hmm. the idea is that you're, you witness what happened with as little charge as possible. The idea being that ourselves carry our charges and have opinions. And the aware ego process is the place where you make choices and ideally make more aware choices. But awareness itself is literally a witness. 
just, oh, that happened. Oh, I went to my responsible one. Then I went to my, I don't care self. And I'm saying it with words, but in fact, the experience could be quite visceral and not so much thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, mm -hmm. I think that it might be helpful um, to describe, because as I, as I recall, in voice dialogue, you are actually moving to different chairs as different voices. And then when you get to the awareness level, it's you're, you're sort of standing behind the chairs. Uh, maybe not always, but it's a good image, I think, wouldn't, wouldn't you say, to sort of imagine that in, in these various chairs are your different cells. And then when you're in the aware level, you're, you're sort of behind looking at all the chairs at once. Exactly. And, and for those that are watching, you see your microphone, it would be if Brian had just done a facilitation and then I would stand with him, his microphone stand. So I could now look at my Brian-ness. Ah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier this um, term, which I, two terms I like, which is uh, uh, spiritual bypass and blind spots. Mm. And it's been a, a, a focus it was a focus of my teacher and for me because you see it's so easy to use uh spiritual bypassing to avoid our humanness and our vulnerability and i'm wondering what you can say about helping people to not go with spiritual bypassing and or to be aware of blind spots that might be uh or, or selves moving through them that are causing trouble that they're barely aware of? That's a great question. Yes. Yeah, so the idea being that you ideally you don't go for a spiritual awareness to avoid living. And in voice dialogue, the selves do all kinds of living. And the idea is to not avoid that, which includes pain, discomfort, embarrassment, all of that stuff. And so what happens is often someone will go to a teacher, a guru of, of some sort looking for some healing. And then they follow that person and they do the techniques, but without separating from yourselves, it's like the primary self system goes, oh, that's a good technique. And they literally use the technique to further their agenda, which is to be maybe more perfect, um, but some very, the conscious agenda, whatever that is, not the unconscious, and then mm. maybe develops a spiritual self who knows best, in fact, better than everybody else. And then paradoxically continues the behavior that was hurting them in the first place, judges themselves, judges other people. And so the idea is that with um, voice dialogue, you've separated and you, you, you have a relationship with your difficult selves, that you have met your angry self, your um, judgmental self, your envious self, the killer in you, so that you can engage all of them as part of your human experience and you don't have to use awareness as a secret underground method to avoid emotions and mm. situations. And it also seems to me, uh, Jonathan, your question about um, spiritual bypassing made me think about this. Uh, Bridget, it seems like if you were to make a distinction between your primary cells and your disowned cells, that spiritual bypassing really would be the avoidance of the disowned cells. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, I would say that's absolutely accurate. And could you sort of tell us a little more about the difference between primary cells and disowned cells? So primary, so, so in, we start out as a baby and we need a, our caretaker to take care of us. And so very early on, we develop our primary cells and those cells are partly what comes out of our unique blueprint. They're who we are, no matter what. And others are very much environmentally um, reinforced. So if, and they're, could be gender-based, sibling order-based, um, socioeconomically based, what tension is in the household. So if um, mom loves a sweet little girl baby, then that little one will learn to do pleaser and passive, maybe dependent, maybe even victim, like 
can always be there ready to be saved. And these are all primary selves and they look different depending on the person. And, 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 and then that particular person would have to disown an equal and opposite energy. So then the disowned selves for that one would be angry, disobedient, rebellious, has an actual opinion, knows what she wants. And what happens is these develop so early and are so reinforced so well. And then again, at developmental stages, like going to school, uh, then going to high school, that kind of thing, that that particular person may be so un, uh, detached from her anger, she literally doesn't feel it. She's not lying when she says, no, 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 I don't get angry. And <laughs> even what I also love about voice dialogue, you can see it in people's bodies. Even if they don't know voice dialogue, you can see people's selves kind of ripple through sometimes. They're like, not me. And then they'll turn around and say some horrible gossip. And that's where they'll put their anger. They're like, not me. But anyway, do you believe what Shirley did yesterday? I can't, you know, and they're, they're, and they're blind to it all. So I'm going to go to church on Sunday, but I bet I don't see Shirley there. <laughs> uh -huh. You right, know, right. judgment, judgment, judgment. Yep. Do you think something like voice dialogue can uh, shrink disharmonious selves or uh, selves that cause us trouble? And if so, how does that process work? I think it does because you have a direct relationship with yourselves. So you would have met this disharmonious self, whatever it was, and you would know its history in you. And, um, and, and so then when a situation arises and, and this self just is like wanting to, to be disharmonious in your aware ego process, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. And you may even decide you want to put a little bit of it out. So you're not squelching anymore. You're making more conscious decisions and you may even choose to up a little of the disharmony. In other words, your relationship changes to it. So the relationship is more harmony, har has more harmony. Yeah. I, went, I once uh, led a, a short workshop called Endarkenment, Ooh. which was uh, to let all the selves that are up speak exactly what they think. And this was amongst friends. So, you know, we could say anything. And it was hysterical. We were all like belly laughing within 10 minutes and very freeing, a lot of energy. And um, I thought of doing that again. It's a really interesting process to let it out in in a group oh my gosh i can you know, it, it, that's wild i love it yeah it was a lot of fun and as i said uh it was it was so freeing after a while we just start to feel intense love uh because all this energy had been freed up yeah yeah and in terms of clients who suffer from self-hate that love can come for themselves as well. I sometimes mm -hmm. like to say compassion is a consequence of the work. You don't have to aim for it. Mm -hmm. Would that kind of a thing need to be done with people who know each other pretty well? Uh, and it's safe. I mean, it might, you know, or maybe as an expert facilitator, you would be there to, um, to guide them through any uh, rough waters. My experience is that it only could work with a group that had total trust and 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 knew each other. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, you might be able to do it over a few days if people could develop that trust, but it's it's initially a very scary thing until you kind of reach critical mass and you realize everybody has has uh, call it dirty selves that they are always squelching. And it, then it becomes pretty funny. Um, it's, it's almost like an alternate reality that we're living in. In fact, I, I once saw a video like that where these, a guy hits, uh, has a minor fender bender. And uh -huh. instead of going the no way they normally do, they start talking from what's really happening. Like, I'm in my blamer and you're a piece of crap. And the other guy says, well, I'm, I'm in my fearful uh, self, so I don't know what to say, and I will just take abuse. And they go back and forth like this, and you realize that's actually what's going on, you know? That's right. 
<laughs> that really is the way people interact, right? Yeah, you very interesting. See it, you probably see that all the time, Bridget. That kind of. Oh, I I love this. It's so true. Or the and then the other blamer that says that stupid idiot that cut me off. The one that's like it's never my fault. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But all of that is going on. Mm -hmm. Um, your book deals primarily with how different selves get in the way of us accomplishing goals, especially towards when we're close to a goal. I'm wondering why you focused on that and, and um, what you've learned in, in specializing in that work. So it literally came out of my practice. I, I was working with a lot of people who are talented and motivated. And I also knew because I had worked with them over time that they actually were taking the steps they said they were. They, mm -hmm. And over and over, I would see a stall, a literal halt as basically the universe said yes. And it was in all fields. I will work a lot with creatives. I'm a former performer. So I work with performers and writers, but it happened with people that were in a, working in law firms. And I realized it came out one day like, oh my gosh, it's a final eighth issue. These are doers and achievers. And they had done so much, taken so many steps, like the first seven eighths and over and over something would happen. And it was a mystery. It was a mystery to them. And it was a mystery to me because like, right, they had done the work. And I would see things like someone put together a bunch of plays and that they had written and performed that worked well. And a publisher actually wanted her to put them together because she, this publisher thought it would be great for a high school. And she never got the publisher the material. Mm -hmm. And that was a big one. Like that's all she had to do by the time she'd done it. It already had accolades. It had already worked. It had already been requested. She didn't, and that's when I'm like something, it's not, if it's not logical, it's emotional and it's something else. And then I came to realize that although all of these clients were like, yes, I'm for this with every fiber of my being, it wasn't true. There were some fibers that were absolutely not for this goal and they were wise. So often people think of resistance and that's a self as the enemy. Okay, double down and work harder you know, the primary self systems rules. Well, just be nicer. Well, obviously you're lazy, just be less lazy. And these were people that that was not the issue. And so we'd have, we'd go talk to those other parts. Like, well, it was hard for some people to even admit that there might be a part that wasn't for the goal. It was like a grief. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, we have to go there because you're, you're the not doing is running your calendar. Your days are full of not doing. So why don't we at least Talk to the people who are running your calendar right now mm -hmm. and, or the inner parts of you. And so yeah. that's when I realized that these parts, two things, they all had wisdom. They were not the enemy. And so one of them, it was um, a, a, a different client who this self came out and said, absolutely not. And she had gotten uh, a really good part in a play and was about to move up further. And this part said, you think she can't handle life right now. If she gets more celebrity, basically, she's going to become an alcoholic and die. Mm. And that's the first I even heard she thought she had trouble with alcohol. And mm. I'm like, wow, tell me more. <laughs> and then when we got back to center, it was very powerful. And my client didn't resist. She's like, it's true. And I'm like, well, now let's talk about that because that had never come up before. So that's one is that this don't do it has wisdom and just find out what it is. And voice dialogue is so helpful with that. And the other part is a lot of these selves that are against the goal are actually attached to early beliefs from their original caregivers. It's mm -hmm. their core negative beliefs. They don't feel worthy and it's a distorted loyalty. So these parts are like, no, you can't give up. Life sucks and then you die, mom would hate that. And, and again, in the sessions, people are stunned that these little, little parts have such strength in their life. And they often are three and four years old. And as Sidra Stone, who co-created says, A, our, our little selves are our oldest selves. 
which is kind of interesting. But those selves, they only have the skills that they know from their age of development. So all they can do is say no. And they fundamentally believe what they were told, that life's not worth living if you don't make a million dollars a year or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then again, back to separation and awareness, with that awareness, very delicately, you, you, you can unlock from the double bind that puts you in because it's a distorted loyalty between what I want or am I going to abandon unconsciously my family, my, my ancestors, whatever it is. So how does something like that get healed? Like, let's say you have that part that says, well, I'll become an alcoholic or I'll do this or some destructive thing. The aware ego is becoming aware of it, but do, do, do you sometimes have the aware ego talk to that part, for example? No, you'd have the aware ego be aware of that part. Uh -huh. So that part, so that would be potentially two parts. One could be the drinker. So the part that kind of told on my client that said, I'm not letting it happen or else she'll become an alcoholic may not be the drinker in her. That mm -hmm. may be the scared little girl who's got a history, say, in the family of being around two alcoholic parents. Mm -hmm. so, so we'd find out the actual function of that part. But let's say we go to the drinker. Then we'd go to the drinker. And the aware ego would get the awareness, but wouldn't have to talk. And the drinker says, I love drinking. And here's why. And F you this, because I'm not going to stop drinking. And by the way, I help her. Do you know how many dates she gets when she gets a little of me and her? And I just listen because this is a gift. Then when we go back to center, we're like, let's take the gifts. This is the detox sort of. This one is charismatic and links and has fun and joins. How can you do that safely and without relying on alcohol? And so that's where voice dialogue absolutely deals with reality. So if this person has a genuine problem, like, like literally needs detox, it's so bad, that's okay. There's space for that. Or then also we would never ask that part to change. Now the behavior can change. So that part may have to stop drinking, but she can always love drinking. You can, you can say, yeah, that was wonderful times. And so some of voice dialogue really is about grief, right? Mm -hmm. You're saying goodbye to that primary self running your show. You're never saying goodbye to a self. They're always around, but who leads and how through the aware ego process does change. And back to, you know, tolerating hard feelings. You have to tolerate the grief of that. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think one of the most important things that I learned from working with you in voice dialogue, because we did actually spend quite some time um, uh, learning about it and with you facilitating um, voice dialogue sessions, is that there are parts of me that may have contributed to either fear or inhibition or as in the final eighth um, uh, any kind of self-sabotaging techniques i always thought of them as the enemy as bad parts of myself and what i realized was that these parts were there to protect me they were installed maybe really, really young, and maybe they don't, I don't need that kind of protection anymore, but they were there originally to protect me from that core deep wound. And protection is an act of love. So they became not the enemy anymore, and the shift in perspective of that is, is huge. And that's where some of the healing comes in. Jonathan, to answer mm -hmm. your question, truly. Great. Uh, go on, Brian. You... No, that was uh -huh. pretty much what I had to say. I, I, uh -huh. it, my next thing would be, I, I wanted to just to take a little moment here to acknowledge that you learned voice dialogue directly over many, many years from Hal and Sidra Stone, who originated who developed it they the and um and we just lost hal stone this week and so i just wanted to perhaps maybe dedicate this podcast episode to hal stone thank you That's brian me. i would love that yes he died in his peace uh peacefully in in the night uh just a few days ago and at 92 
Um, and he was a great teacher and it would be an honor to have this podcast dedicated to him. He and his wife, Sidra, created voice dialogue since the 1970s and really um, added to the rich uh, landscape of that era. California, California led and maybe still leads, I will give them credit in that kind of thing. And it was an idea he had, like just as a seed, because he's Jungian, way earlier. But it wasn't until he met Sidra um, and they they both got married after leaving their original marriages, so they they represented their second lives together, and that they both um, really solidified and then made it their life's work to put voice dialogue out there. And she is a Brooklyn-born cognitive behavioral therapist, and he's a Jungian analyst. So they both brought in all kinds of sides. And they really used their relationship as teacher for themselves, but also for their students. And they were very generous. We, um, Hal and Sidra, who is now his widow, are my beloveds. And um, we're in mourning. Although he prepared us, his generosity over the years, he talked about aging. And the, the secret to aging is really embracing your new vulnerability. Uh, and this came out when he was maybe in his 70s. He actually broke his back because he had been working on his roof and that was fine. He went back down. He had some company expected and he's like, oh, I want to do just one more thing as if he was 40 and not 70. And that was that second time he came and mm -hmm. fell off his roof and broke his back of which he, uh, he completely healed over time. But that's when he realized if I don't pay attention to my new vulnerabilities, whatever it is that age brings, I'm not going to have a graceful, full aging process. And so he shared, every time he'd have a new one, he'd share with us, and I think some of them are online, just what he called conscious aging, and that the key is cultivating new selves that maybe you didn't need. And he, I think, got his black belt in Aikido when he was 60. So he was really a physical person but he had to rely less on less on physical prowess. And he did, and he showed us how to do that with humility. And he was certainly a spiritual person. Um, yeah. And yeah. Beautiful. I like that term, embracing new vulnerability. I haven't heard that term. And wh what's that mean to you? I think uh, for me, it would mean kind of being in the present. So if, if you used to be able to charge through and you find you're just exhausted in a way that doesn't like it wasn't it isn't the way it used to be and maybe it's because you're getting older but who, it could be for other reasons that instead of going back to your primary self of just push through which is going to injure you you say okay and you feel the hard feelings you feel the disharmony you feel the grief like i loved my push through self mm. But mm -hmm. you, you can come sometimes, but you can't have the whole show. So that's what I would say, new vulnerabilities. And, you know, there are new vulnerabilities when you get a diagnosis. I mean, sometimes mm -hmm. life just gives you new vulnerabilities. But then the choice you have is how you are in relation to that, what awareness you bring. So that's, what would it mean to you? Uh, well, I, I thought your description was great. And in a certain way, we always have a choice of uh, going with spiritual bypassing or not even spiritual bypassing, just lying. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just, mean sinning? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How are you? I'm fine, you know, when you're not. Yes. Um, or, or just embracing the new vulnerability of the moment as it shows up. But certainly as we get older, uh, new things show up and and it gives us more opportunities if you can embrace it if you yeah. see that as a as a wonderful process rather than as a process to avoid then you are certainly closer to allowing what is and allowing what is is the entry point to the Disneyland known as pure awareness yes yes Sidra sometimes likes to say voice dialogue is the fountain of youth because you have less constriction, you actually have more energy. And I've mm -hmm. always loved, then the paradox is, it's the fountain of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I only have one more question. I don't know if you have anything else, Brian, but um, I, I heard just from Brian as, as we were coming on that you were a stand-up comic. I'm wondering, you know, uh, my teacher used to say, if you learn to watch yourself, you will um, always be entertained because there's so many parts of us doing so many funny things when you get down to it. You know, the other day I was, I was reaching over the, um, the end piece of bread uh, in my refrigerator. And I sometimes will say what I observe. So I said, I want the good piece. I'll leave the crappy piece for my wife. <laughs> you know, and I realize how funny that is because I love her, but you know, here I am uh, getting the good piece for me and leaving the lousy piece for her. And it just strikes me as funny when I do stuff like that. And I'm wondering, has voice or did voice dialogue kind of help inform your comedy? So I found voice dialogue because I was searching for a creativity tool. So uh -huh. I, I basically found improvisation and voice dialogue in the same year. And I was an actress and um, that's how I know Brian. Uh, we, he directed me as an actor. I hope I'm allowed to say. Yes. Um, and he's a wonderful actor, that too, and singer. So, so I, I, I took this class on comedy writing because I wanted more control over my career. Instead of just auditioning, everything was like about, please choose me. Then I realized, okay, I have all this technique, but what about the juice? How do I find something to actually shape? And in there, synchronicitously, I read uh, the John Bradshaw book, Healing the Shame That Binds You. Mm -hmm. And in the back of it, he's got maybe 70 pages of different, what I don't like to call alternative, healing modalities. And voice dialogue was in there. And I read it. I'm like, that's it. That mm -hmm. is it. And I hunted the stones down by calling their 1-800 number, because that's how you did it then. And it did. So I'm a small white woman and I grew up in Harlem. So I would play the opposites. And a lot of time people project on me being sweet and um, I apparently incapable of doing bad things. And so that gives me a lot of leeway. I mean, one time I literally did not study. I was a very good student and I don't know why I didn't, but my rebel just in high school said no. So I failed my uh, sit ed class. Do you know the teacher thought it was his fault that he had somehow messed up the test and the test counted for nobody that whole class. <laughs> so yeah, so, and then um, I would do things like how the hippie chicks who are supposed to be all so loving were the meanest girls at any party and I wanna be next to the Chanel girl and with her beautiful pocketbook who's probably giving money away to all these wonderful organizations while the hippie chicks are like fighting over a crumb and kicking people out of the flute room if they bring in a drum. So yeah. <laughs> so you'd really go, you'd really get into these characters in yourself and in other people. It sounds like it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And then what happened was speaking of healing, I got, I just got more trained in it just as something to do. It was not my plan. I saw the healing happen so quickly and so breathtakingly. I eventually switched over and then I did get a degree so that I would could become a licensed psychotherapist, but it was always to be able to come back and bring voice dialogue into the healing world because it was breathtaking how people would get in touch with these parts because it wasn't intellectual. And yeah. then also creatively, the metaphors that come out. I mean, I love your idea is about the comedy, the natural comedy behind having like what's up upstairs versus downstairs, but via right. psyche. Right, right. Well, speaking of going beyond the intellectual into the experiential, we hear that you have a, a guided meditation where yes. people can learn a little bit about some of these selves or experience them. Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll just start. Uh, unless you have anything else you want to add, Brian? No, I think we should dive right in. Okay. okay. Sounds good. So what I would like you to do is close your eyes if you like. No one has to close their eyes. And for those viewers that would like to, you can move to a different part of the room when I tell you, or you can just imagine it where you are. 
but I want you to think of a self. I'm not going to tell you what to think of, but a self that works a lot in your life. Um, it could be a responsible self, an anxious self, a pleaser. It could be an athlete self, whatever it is. And think about that self. If you're not sure, you can think about, oh, what did I do yesterday? And think of something you did and what self led with that. And when you have that self in mind, you can either go to a different section of the room or like move a few inches in your chair and physiologically embody that self. And if you're having any trouble with that, you can think about something that self would say, maybe one of their phrases. And feel where that self is in your body. Is it carried in your shoulders? Is it deeper in your hips? Maybe it actually feels sort of like an energy that's outside of your body. Not all of our selves are actually in our physical body. Some selves might be energy fields around it. Notice your breath. This self might be giving you thoughts like, oh, don't forget to do this, or oh, we better hurry up with this meditation because I've got things to do. Just let it go. And notice what kind of energy it has. Is it languid, slow? Is it staccato, sharp, pulsating? If this self is normally a talker, notice how the energy is that it doesn't have the outlet of speaking. Just notice it. Notice if it's easy to stay here or if you're kind of wanting to get off. Maybe it's super comfortable. Before we go back to center and drop this energy, just notice if this part wants you to know something. Does this part have a message for you? Something it would like you to take care of if you could. It could be something literal. It could also be something physical, like do you need to get a little more rest or get some water? Maybe have a little more time. And then letting go of this energy, if you had moved a little, you can go back to center. But either way, just feel yourself letting go of this energy of this particular self that you chose. And as we end, we can I'll throw out some questions you could journal, but we are still going to go now to a different self. Try to choose a self that's an opposite or dissimilar. It does not have to be some direct opposite. And just think about that self. What self do you think wants some energetic embodiment right now?
And if you can't decide, then pick that one, the self that can never decide. And again, if you want to move a little from your center spot to enter the second self, feel free. Or you can do it in center, but now feel the energy of this particular self that you've chosen. Fill your body. And notice where it is in your body. What type of energy it has. Notice where this self breathes. Some selves take deep breaths, others barely breathe. And just be with that self to the best of your ability without an agenda. Just curious, like, oh, even curious, like, why did this self show up? Hi, hello. As you breathe and notice the self, be aware of impulses. Do you want to get off this self? Are you happy that you're here? And in this self, tell your, say out loud, what, I'm sorry, say to yourself, what, what do you, would you like? What does this self want that you could give it? It could be concrete. It could be energetic. It could be time with a particular person or being or dog. And then feeling that energy of that self leaving and if you've moved to one side for this, go back to your center, because this is what we call the aware ego process. You've now entered and separated from two different selves. We're not quite finished with this meditation because I want you to bring up 50% of the first self you were in and just play with that. If I was just going to bring up 50% of that self, what would that feel like? And now bring it up 90%. Not all the way, but a lot of the way. And then dropping it completely, dropping all that energy of that first self. Now I want you to bring up the 50% of the energy of the other self you went to. Just 50%. Play with that. Play with your energetic awareness of this self. And now bring that self up 90%. Again, not flooding your entire being with this self, but just a little bit that's not this self. 90% is this self. And 
And now dropping that energy, we're going to end with one more energetic meditational exercise, which is go back to that first self and bring up 50% of that energy. Just let it be a 50%. Now maintain that 50% while you try and bring up 50% of the other self. So now you've got two selves, both there at 50%. This is what the aware ego process does. The aware ego is a dance between our different selves, our different energies. It's like you get to design your own fragrance, your own energetic fragrance. And now dropping both of those selves energies. And for just a few seconds, I want you to feel whatever it is you're feeling, because this is the aware ego process. You're different now in this second because of the experience you had in the last second. And so the aware ego process is wherever you are more or less centered in this moment. And as you bring your focus back toward the external world, maybe I'll give you a couple of questions if you want to journal later, but you can ask yourself, why did this self come out for each self? You can think about what that self wanted and journal about that. Well, my self wanted X. Let me see what that's about. Can I do it? How can I do it? Also, in my experience, I've never seen two selves appear randomly together. So even if they don't seem like they have a relationship, they do somewhere. So that's a really interesting question to journal. Like, why these two? It might be obvious, and it may not. And it may be obvious, and then there's also some hidden answers behind that question. So thank you for joining me in an aware ego meditation. Marvelous. It was really interesting. I really liked that. Yeah, it was great. I'm so glad. It was fun to follow along and see who showed up. Really interesting. And, uh, and Do we get uh, to ask or is that on your own private time? <laughs> oh, well, uh, one, one of the cells was that it was the it started out as the pleaser self, but it was really more the um, avoider of criticism self. And then the other self was the um, I'm great. <laughs> I, I, I'm creative. I can do whatever I want. And what it said was set me free. <laughs> I like to say in voice dialogue, sometimes the homework assignments are fabulous. Like set me free. That's your homework. <laughs> And I had the pusher and the beer who are often at odds and then putting them together at the end where I had half of them in each part of my body. Uh, it felt like the Steve Martin movie, All of Me, uh, in which <laughs> uh, if you've seen that as a good yes. representation of voice dialogue. Oh, and, yes. And and um, yeah, it felt really interesting to have them both there at the same time. And I actually would like more of that where they're more integrated in some way and i just want to point out watching both of you i you physically relaxed it didn't matter which parts you went to you both i saw your breathing deepen i saw your muscles relax and that happens with voice dialogue obviously with meditation and these exercises but there's something that releases regardless of the intensity of the work mm -hmm. or maybe i should say because of the intensity of the work perhaps mm -hmm. Well, you've been very informative, entertaining, and inspiring, Bridget. I really appreciate uh, you joining us and exploring with us. And 
learning a lot about voice dialogue that I didn't know. So I really appreciate that as well. Yes, yes. Thanks so much for joining us. And again, your uh, Bridget's new book is The Final Eighth, Enlist Your Inner Selves to Accomplish Your Goals. And uh, where can we find out more about the book and about uh, voice dialogue? Uh, is there a I have a website actually called finaleighth.com. And so all the information is there. You can order it there. I have a website on voice dialogue too, which is connected to the final eighth.com. And so anyone's welcome to contact me. If you go online, all my info is there, email, social media, but final eighth.com. Great. And the, uh, the meditations for Bridget and everybody else is on awareness explorers.com. We have a meditation section and all the usual, uh, tell your friends, tell your family, uh, tell yourself, all the different selves, because there's a lot of them. You may have to repeat it a few times. <laughs> and as always, uh, make sure you continue having fun with Keep Exploring. Keep exploring. Uh, keep exploring. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more, you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. We'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends, because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.